This um, project is funded by FINRA, as well as Salt Lake County Libraries, the American Library Association, and then um, USU Extension. So as part of this grant that FINRA and the American Libraries Association sponsored, they wanted these classes to be recorded, to be posted online, to be accessible um, for other people in the future. So she's not trying to record any of you, but she's recording the slideshow and then the presentation. My name is Shauna, um, and I work at Utah State University Extension. I work just as a community educator and I specialize in finance and financial education. If you guys have questions, we're going to talk about credit reports and credit scores tonight. If you guys have questions about a topic that we haven't addressed here, um, I do have cards. And feel free to give me a call or shoot me an email. Um, and I could talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, and we'd be happy to get another class scheduled if you felt like it's something friends or family would be interested in as well. Um, so that's how this grant kind of came to be, and that's how these classes are able to be sponsored free of charge um, is just through this grant. If you guys have questions, like raise your hand or just like holler out and we'll try and get to those. I'm going to talk a little bit, or I'm going to spend a little bit more time on credit reports. Um, and then at the end, we'll touch on credit scores. But if you've got questions, let me know. And then Liesl's going to grab copies of the slides for all of you. One of the slides that we'll touch on didn't copy as well as I hoped because it was too colorful. And so that information is right up here on the board. And then I'm going to also I have a handout as well. So we'll go ahead and just get started. Um, tonight, what we're going to discuss is what's a credit score, what's a credit report, how can you dispute inaccuracies in your credit. Um, a lot of times, as we get older and the longer we've had credit, there's things that are wrong. Could be a wrong address, it could be inaccurate information. If you've been the victim of identity theft, some of that stuff on there might not even be yours, but it's tied to your name, social, because somebody took it, essentially, and used it. And then we'll touch on what scores are. Um, the difference between a credit report and a credit score. The credit report is essentially a summary of all of your payment history and your credit accounts. This could be credit cards, it could be loans, um, it could be public records if you have judgments or bankruptcies on there. Um, also, your criminal history can actually show up on your credit report as well. Um, your credit score is essentially just like your grade point average in high school. It's just a summary of how you're doing, a snapshot at that one moment in time. So your credit score is susceptible to change. You might check it today and you might be at a 750, and then you might check it again in six months and you might get a 775, just because your credit history or your credit accounts have aged, which is a good thing. Um, and then maybe you have made some more on-time monthly payments and are trying to repair some things that way. Um, because of a law that was passed way back, I think, 10 or 11 years ago, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, each of us is allowed to get a free copy of our credit report once a year from these three bureaus. Today, when I talk about bureaus or credit agencies, I use the two term interchangeably. I'll try and be consistent and just call them credit bureaus. But the credit bureaus are the people that gather information on us. So there's TransUnion, Experian, and Equifax. Those are the three national companies and the three most common ones. The Fair Credit Reporting Act, or FCRA, um, allows you to receive the three free copies of your report a year. It regulates who can gain access to your report. Not anyone can just go in and say, I want to find out about Dan's credit history, and I'm going to see how he pays his bills, I'm going to see what's on there. Just as a civilian, like a person, I could not do that. If I worked for a bank and Danny came in to apply for a loan, then I would have access to pull that. So the people that can actually pull your reports or gain access to them are mortgage companies, um, banks or credit unions if you're applying for a loan. It could also be an insurance company or an insurance provider for car insurance or for life insurance. Um, health insurance, they typically don't pull your credit reports, but your landlords could also pull your credit reports. How many of you have applied for a job and they've asked to check your credit? Okay, a lot of us. It's very, very common, especially if you're going to be dealing with money um, in any aspect. If you're a cashier, if you're an accountant, if you're an auditor, if you have access to any kind of funds, they want to see how you're managing your credit. And a lot of times they'll make some hiring decisions based off of that. Employers can only pull your credit report if you give them permission to do so. 
So your Danny's employer can't all of a sudden just get mad at Danny and decide they're going to go pull up his credit report and like destroy his good name. They can only pull that if you have given them permission to do so. Um, and then the, the law is actually enforced by the Federal Trade Commission, which is the government agency back in Washington, D.C. that's there to kind of protect our consumer rights. Um, and then this report also made it possible for consumers like us to go in and correct errors. Prior to this law passing, there would be errors and inaccuracies in the credit reports, but there wasn't really a whole lot we could do to fix those. So we'll talk um, a little bit about what we can do to fix those tonight. By a show of hands, how many of you guys have actually disputed items on your credit report or found inaccuracies? Okay. How was your experience? Was it an effective one? Did it go as well as you hoped or not really? Not really. Not, okay, so it didn't go as well as you hoped. I was using uh, uh, picture credit for whatever. Okay, so not a good experience. How was your experience? Um, it, it was negative because it was a big bang. It was Bank of America. So, yeah, they did my credit twice for a, I guess you'd call it a charge off on a, this back in like 2008. Mm -hmm. A house I sold. So anyway, so they ding me twice for one event. For one event. So I was just trying to take the one off. Actually, well, and they agreed to the circumstance, so they got what they wanted. Yet they still didn't me twice. So I didn't. And you're in the process right now. Process okay. Okay. She just sent her letters off on Monday. So well, that's to be determined. So we need to find out there. Um, you can order those three free credit reports a year, but there are extenuating circumstances and what-if situations that allow you to pull another credit report if you need it. Um, I, what I typically do is I'll pull mine every four months. So I'll start the year off with Equifax and then Experian and I end the year with TransUnion. There's not a reason behind that. That's just the order that I have it in my head so I can remember. Question, Bob. I, I just... I wonder about doing them spread out like that because, like you said, it changes over time. So wouldn't it be better to do it all at once and see how to compare? Good question. And it's a personal preference. Um, you could pull them. Let's say you decide that, like, March is always going to be your kind of like your financial, like, kickoff month and see where you're at. You can pull all three to make sure that they all match. And there's nothing wrong with that. I like to just spread mine out to kind of track... What I mostly do it for is to kind of track for identity theft or just any fraudulent activity. So I'll pull one and then wait a couple of months just to make sure that nobody else is in there messing around. So it's just completely your own preference. And if you want to pull all three at one time, you can. There's nothing wrong with that. Danny. So you can pull once a year each different credit bureau? Yes. Yeah. Each different credit bureau. So it's not just you get to do it once for one. Yeah. So you'll get... I say once a year, but you'll end up with three different reports. And then, so we're each entitled to those three different reports once a year. And then, based on these extenuating circumstances, we can contact the bureau or whatever one we choose and say, this is my situation, I need to pull another report free of charge. And you just want to specify that free of charge. Um, if you've been unemployed and are applying for, let's say you are super on top of things like Bob, only pull your three reports in January. And then six months later, you lose your job and you're unemployed for a few months. You go back in to apply for another job or they're gonna offer you a job maybe in August. You are, as an unemployed person, allowed to get an additional credit report um, if you're applying for work in the next six years. And let's say Danny wanted to go in, he had experience in the past as an accountant, he was looking for another job as an accountant. He, they want you to be able to have access to these reports because as an accountant, almost guaranteed they're going to pull your credit. And they want you to be able to see if there's been any negative information in there and have the opportunity to dispute that information if it's necessary. So if you're unemployed and are looking for work, if you're receiving public assistance, um, that could be food stamps, it could be housing vouchers, it could be um, Medicaid or CHIP, you're allowed to get uh, one additional free report a year. Um, if you have reason to believe that you're a victim of identity theft, you can also get an additional report. And then if you have applied for a loan and they denied you because they said you had a negative item in your report, you can access um, 
your free report then as well. Are there any questions on this bottom? So you can't get a report from each one, you can only pick one? As for my research, as far as I could tell today, I was going in and studying it all. We all can get the TransUnion, the Equifax, and Experian once a year, and then you can go back in and choose which one you want to use. Except, and there's kind of a qualifier to that, let's say you went in to apply for an auto loan and they denied you, and the company you applied for your loan through used Equifax. Then that company has to give you the information so you can go in and pull that Equifax report. Let's say maybe a month later, you went in and applied for another, like car loan, because you thought, man, something is wrong. I know I paid my bills on time. I should have access to this. If you go into that second car dealership and they pull your report and are using TransUnion and deny you credit, then you can receive the, the second free report through TransUnion. So it's wherever you're getting denied from or whatever bureau they're using, that's where you can get it. Question? Our question is just a little different we're talking about. I um, periodically check um, credit comments yes. and they go through TransUnion. Um, why is there, the, why is TransUnion for me, and I've been checking with them for like the last two years, why is TransUnion typically a lower score than Equifax most of the time? Why is that? Good question. So her question is, why is TransUnion typically a lower credit score than Equifax? And it's going to be because, and we'll, I'll give you kind of a breakdown of how the credit score is calculated, but every company can weight different items on your credit report differently. My sister recently purchased a home. Her TransUnion score was always 10 to 15 points lower than Equifax and Experian. So it's just by how TransUnion weights your score and the things that they look at. So if, and, and maybe in your situation, your goal is, okay, I want my TransUnion score to be X because I know if it is an Experian and Equifax are gonna be better, but it's by how they weight the scores. Does that answer your question? It's not like a happy answer, but it does answer my question. Thank you. I just don't like. I don't think that's fair. Right. <laughs> right. No, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. Um, your free access to your reports, and as a Utah State Extension agent, as a library, we can't tout one service over another, except in this situation. So, Credit Karma is a service that allows you to go in and get your reports, and then they do credit scores. As far as I know, that service is free of charge, correct? So Credit Karma will do your scores free of charge. The site that I'm gonna refer to and probably be to death tonight is annualcreditreport.com. And my reasoning behind that is because annualcreditreport.com is the only site that is authorized through the Federal Trade Commission to provide and issue these three free reports a year. I'm not, I don't wanna speak negatively of Credit Karma or any of those other sites, it's just that credit, annualcreditreport.com is the only one that's been authorized to do that, and so that's where I'm going to send you to. You can order your report online at annualcreditreport.com. You can um, call and order it on the phone, and I actually called this phone number on Tuesday, and it's an automated system, and then you go in and you punch in your information, and they'll process your request for you. Or if you just are kind of unsure about the internet thing or don't have a computer that you trust, and kind of the phone, you're like, yeah, I don't really know. If you prefer good old-fashioned snail mail, there is an order form um, that you can use to fill out and request your report. If you're interested, we can pass these out and you guys can have these. Um, on this report or on this form, they actually include up here the website and the phone number and then this address. I know this is actually the slide that didn't copy off very well for you on your site. Who's interested in these forms? I'm just gonna pass them all around. I might need to snap one more. But on there, if you decide to send this in by mail, and one of the reasons you might want this form is if you try and access it online and it doesn't work, you can send this form in. And typically, all of the clients I've worked with in the past have been able to, if they haven't been able to get it online, they've been able to get it through access of this. Make sure when you fill this out that you fill it out in legible writing. Um, and then indicate at the bottom, it says there's three bubbles. They say Equifax, TransUnion, or Experian. Fill in the circle completely of which reports you want. If you want all three at one time, fantastic. If you just want one and then you want to order one in a couple months, you can do that as well. Um, and after the class is over, 
I can walk you through what it looks like on annualcreditreport.com, and we can try and pull your report and then email it to you as a PDF. Um, you can even try it. Weasel, can we get them access to the library computers? Mm -hmm. Okay, as participants of the class, you can get your access to those computers out there, and then you can print them as well if you want to. Um, so that is the three ways that you can get your credit report that way. What do you need when you order your credit report? You're going to need your personal information. So your name, your social, your address, um, and then your date of birth. If you move around, I am prone to move around a lot, and so you have to have any addresses that you've lived in the last two years, just because they want to verify that you're actually you and somebody's not trying to steal your identity. And then when you go in and order your report online, they're going to ask you four to five identifying questions about accounts that are on your credit report. I made a coworker poll her report yesterday because I wanted to watch what her experience was like. Um, it took her about 15 minutes to fill out the form and get the report. She had to call her husband twice to find out the amount of a car loan and the amount of a mortgage because he, she, they both work and put their money in a big pot, but then he makes sure the bills get paid. And she had no idea how much either of those were. were. And it said, you have a mortgage open on or around April 2008. What's the amount of that mortgage? And she didn't know. So she called, got the answer, and then answered the question. If you don't answer those questions properly or you miss an answer, um, just because they don't want somebody going in to steal your information, it will probably say your request cannot be processed at this time. Please call us or send in the mail form. When you send in your mail form, they sometimes, if they can go in and see that you tried accessing it online and missed a question, they might ask for a copy of a driver's license or something like that. So don't get scared <coughs> if they send you a request for a driver's license or some other information about your identity, like a bill or something. They're just wanting to make sure truthfully that you are who you say you are. Some very important things to remember. Annually Credit Report is the only um, site that's authorized to give you the free reports. They will never spam or email you. So if you get an email, like let's say you have gone out to annualcreditreport.com and all of a sudden you have an email from them saying, hey, Danny, we want to get you your free credit report. And their credit report is not going to contact you personally. It's probably somebody spamming and impersonating in your credit report. If that happens, make sure that you contact the Federal Trade Commission immediately and you can actually forward that email on to spam at uce.gov because they want to find out who's doing this so they can take them down to protect the American consumers. Um, any questions on this? So when you say you, get, you can get a free report every year, is it a calendar year or every like 12 months from the last time you did it? 12 months from the last time you did it. Yeah. So, and then that's a problem that I have because I told you I order every like three months. I always have to remember exactly what month I did it in so I know when I can request it for the following year. So yes, good question. Any other questions? Yes. Is there a thing for, uh, for us? Fabulous question. Is there a deem to void your credit? Because they want you as a consumer to access your report and feel comfortable doing so, any personal inquiry on your report is called a soft inquiry and it does not deem you. It will show up on an inquiry section and I'll show you kind of, I couldn't show you like an actual credit report because I don't want to give anyone's personal information away, but I'll show you where we'll go in and see that. And on the inquiry you'll see that it says Equifax, October 20th, and you know that was me because I wanted to but it's not going to hurt your score in any way. So good question there. Are you going to go over the things that do affect your... <clears throat> yep, I will. Okay, what's on your credit report? Your credit report has these five things on there. The biggest thing are your trade lines or your credit information. Trade lines are um, information just about your account. If you have a Discover credit card, your account information is going to show the name, the contact information for your creditor. It's going to show how much you owe on that credit card, as well as your available credit limit. And then when you pull your credit report, you're going to see all of these signs. Like, you're going to see like little green squares or like um, circles. And it's going to look like this. And it will probably sometimes, if you've had the account for more than three years, take up a large portion of your report. And then it will have a date. So it will say like 2015 up here. And it says January, February, March, April, May, 
and so on. If your boxes are highlighted in green or like a check, that means you made your payments on time. Let's say in June you lost your job and weren't able to make your payment and you were 30 days late, you're gonna see like a red X there. If you fall behind again on your payment and miss it for the second month, you might see the first 30, 60, and then up to 120. So you're gonna see on your report a very detailed payment history or, or um, summary of your accounts on there, that's part of your trade lines. It will show personal information. I do have a friend that just tried to pull her credit report and her, it had her name inaccurately. Somehow a credit creditor had put in a wrong last name for her when she had applied for a car loan, but that information went on her credit report, so right now she's in the process of disputing that because the last name listed is not hers. Um, they're gonna have your addresses and dates of birth as well. You might find addresses on there that you've never lived at. That could be a red flag for identity theft and is reason to send in a dispute letter to just address that and say, hey, I never lived there, please take that off. Another reason, if you get your credit report and you see inaccurate information, your personal information is inaccurate to get it off, is because the next time you go in to pull your credit report, one of those identifying questions they may ask you is, we have shown that you've lived on a street that was 2030, and then they want you to fill in the address and it might be 2030 Palm Street. Well, if you've never lived at 2030 Palm Street, but that address is in your credit report, you're not gonna be able to answer that question correctly. And for some reason, every time I go into pull my credit report, they always ask me what streets I've lived on. And I have to remember, I've moved 10 times in the last five years, and I have to remember, and it's a pain. So make sure when you get that report that the addresses are correct. There's gonna have information on there about public records. So that's any judgments, any criminal um, activity, as well as any bankruptcies. Negative account information is going to be on there if you've had accounts go to collections and then your inquiries. So inquiries, there's two categories for inquiries. There's a soft inquiry, which is if you've gone in to pull your credit and your creditors are constantly checking your credit. You might be current on your Allstate auto insurance payment, but Allstate's gonna go in and check every month or two because they wanna make sure that you're current on your American Express or your visa payment. If you fall behind on one of your payments, while it's not affecting maybe Allstate, it's only affecting Visa, Allstate might increase your insurance rates. Um, that's the actual website of where you can pull your credit report. And they get mad if you leave the account or their website open for too long without an activity. So <laughs> that's what they're telling me. Um, so on your inquiries, those are soft inquiries. Your companies that you do business with are going to go in and check your report every single month. Those soft inquiries do not hurt your credit in any way, shape, or form. Hard inquiries are if you're going because you want to buy a new car. And I'm going to talk about this now, and we'll talk about it again in a few minutes. But if you're going to buy a car loan, is it wise to shop around? Yes. Yes, absolutely. So if you're going in to buy a car loan, they want to see this consumer is smart and savvy, and he wants to get the best deal. So if you go in and you apply for loans, maybe with three banks and three credit unions, and then possibly a dealer because they're having their year in the event and your 0% financing. If you go in and apply for different car loans within a 30 day period, even though every one of those inquiries is gonna show up on your report, they're gonna lump it just as one and it's not gonna ding your score. I checked on um, FICO and we'll talk about the different scores. There's over 80 credit scores out there. But FICO says that if you're going in and shopping around and checking different rates, they'll just throw it in as one inquiry and that's not going to ding your score. If it does ding your score, it's only going to be by a point or two and it will recover very quickly. So those hard inquiries, they want you to shop around. If you're shopping for a home mortgage, don't get so like channel vision that it's going to destroy your credit and you only go with like the first offer because maybe your second or third offer is the one that's going to give you that better interest rate. And even a half a percentage on a mortgage adds up to hundreds of thousands of dollars and thousands of dollars over the life of that loan. So don't be afraid to shop around. Um, what is not on your credit report? And there's always all these misconceptions and fallacies, and I hear people say this, and I'm like, no, 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 it's not on there. So if, and all of these things that don't go on your credit report if you're current will go on your credit report if you fall behind. So. Your savings and checking account information are not on your credit report. 
Some of you might pull your credit report and say, Shauna is a liar. She told me that my bank information would not go on my credit report. Your information about your savings and checking account will go on your credit report, but if you have like an overdraft line of credit just kind of as a buffer to make sure you don't overdraw your account, because that's an actual loan, that will be on there. So if you guys saw my credit report, you could tell in a heartbeat where I banked because I have an overdraft line of protection, and that's on there, and it tells the credit union that I use. Um, if you're current on medical bills, those will not go to your um, credit report. If you fall behind or miss payments and your medical bills get put in collections, the collection agencies will report those on your credit report. Um, current rent payments. Very, very rarely do landlords pay to report that their tenants are paying on time. Now, if you fall behind and you get evicted and your landlord goes in and passes a judgment against you in small claims court, that will show up on the credit report and that will hurt you. Um, and then utility bill payments do not show up on your credit report either. If you're new to the credit game and you're trying to establish credit and you've never been behind on that payments that you've been making for 10 years and you've never missed a utility payment, what you can sometimes do is contact your landlord or contact the company where you pay your utilities and, and you can say, would you guys be willing to pay to report this to your credit bureau? Because I'm trying to get a car loan and I want to see that I make my payments on time. Chances are they're going to tell you no, don't lose sleep over it, don't cry, don't get broken hearted. Your next question is then going to be, would you mind writing a letter, like a character reference for me, and just include my account summary that I never missed a payment? And oftentimes they're willing to do that. So then you can take that letter into your car dealer or your new landlord or wherever it is that you're needing credit and say, look. My landlord, I've lived there for 10 years, I've always been on time with my payments, well they don't report it to the credit bureau, here's proof I've always made my payments. And your dealer might approve your loan just based on that character reference. So that's one way that you might say, man I don't have credit, or I don't like credit cards, I don't want to have one open, that you could prove to a potential lender that you're responsible for making payments on time. It's a kind of untraditional way of doing it, but it is a possibility. And a few years ago I actually had a friend do this. He refused to get a credit card, and I admire him so much for that, um, but he had his landlord write a letter and he was able to get his car loan. And now his car loan is worth building his credit. How long will information stay on the report? This is always a question that we all want to know, because we'll pull up and our report sometimes is 53 pages long and we think, how on earth I want this stuff gone? So negative information, if you've ever fallen behind on an account, that is going to show up on your credit for seven years. And it's seven years from the time that you fell behind. So just as an example, we're 2015 right now. So let's say I missed a payment in February of 2008. I was in college and I was not paying attention and it just the payment got away from me. So I missed my payment, but then I was able to bring my account back current in March of that same year. This negative notation would have been on my report until February 2015 of this year. So if this were actually a real situation, that should be off my credit report because it's been seven years since it happened. And it's seven years to the month. If I go in and pull my credit report and that negative notation is still showing up there and the seven years have passed, I can then send in the dispute letter to the credit bureau and say, hey, it's been seven years, take that off. And I have sample dispute letters that I can pass out to and I can kind of walk you through that process, okay? Chapter 13 bankruptcy will stay on your credit report for seven years. Okay, so chapter 13 stays on for seven years, and chapter 7 bankruptcy stays on for 10 years. Some of you might be thinking, well, well, they're both bankruptcies, why on earth the difference? With chapter 13 bankruptcy, you actually set up a payment plan. So you're paying back a portion of those debts, so that's why it stays on for three years shorter. The chapter 7 bankruptcy is a complete eradication of the debts that could qualify. You don't pay them back, and so that's why it stays on for 10 years. If you have ever filed bankruptcy, you don't have to wait those 10 years to start rebuilding your credit. The bankruptcy, from the research that I've been able to do, is going to really hurt your credit for those first two to three years. And while it's still on the report, and you probably are not happy that it's there, you might feel guilty or whatever, you can start rebuilding your credit and, and start pursuing positive credit so that at that 10 year mark, that falls off and you're good to go and start your life over and you can actually start, start living your credit life um, 
or like as soon as that bankruptcy has gone through and you can start doing some things to rebuild it that way. Criminal convictions, unfortunately, these are gonna stay on the credit report indefinitely. Um, and then positive information, happily, stays on that credit report indefinitely as well. So you might have an account that your parents co-signed with you on in high school or whatever that was, and it's been 10 years and you might think, why in the heck is that still there? Well, if it's a positive account and always had a positive payment history, it's just gonna stay on there and it's it's helping you, it's not hurting you. If you really hate it on there, you can try and have them take it off. They may or may not do it, but if it's positive, it's not hurting you. So, any questions? Yes? Uh, I'm sorry I wasn't here last week. Two weeks ago, uh, you said you would verify if a uh, creditor sells your negative account to somebody else. Does the seven-year clock restart, or is it still from the first date? From the first date? Good question. Let me, okay, we'll go over that right now. Great. So I'm going to give you a question. If I don't answer it properly through this, okay. stop me again, and we'll go back, okay? Great. So we had, had, we had this question, this discussion a couple of weeks ago. What does this mean? You might see on your credit report something that says charged off, or you might see a big, like, CO. Let's say I fell behind on my payments and I just stopped making payments altogether, and at that fourth month when it was 120 days past due, they charged the account off. When a company charges an account off, their accountants go in and write it off as a business loss. They are then saying, Danny's debt or credit card is no longer profitable to us. We highly doubt we're ever gonna get any money from it. So we're writing it off as a loss on their taxes as a company that helps them. Does it help you? No. The creditor can still make attempts to collect on that debt, and when a creditor sells your debt to a collection agency, that collection agency can then also start pursuing collections on you. A charge off account is going to stay on your report for seven years from the date that it, it first went, like the wind went, or they charged it off. For me in this situation, it would have been of July of 2008, so this should be coming off July of 2015. If it's still on there, I am most certainly going to write a letter to get that off of there from then. Did some research with Dave Ramsey, and every state is a little bit different, but when a company, when one collection company sells that account, they maybe had held it for six and a half years, and they were not making any headway with you, and you thought, I'm not paying them because I know they bought that debt for pennies on the dollar, and they might have transferred it to another collection agency, that new collection agency is going to start over and it's going to be on there for seven years. So it kind of resets itself. There are statute of limitations and every state is different. I have information for you to go pull them up because every debt is different. So I was looking for the state of Utah and different debts have statute of limitations of six years. Other debts have statute of limitations for seven years. So I have on a handout and I'm going to pass it out to you just right now. Um, they do... The Utah State Bar has free legal clinics that they do throughout the community on various days of the week. There's always a Tuesday night bar, and that is where lawyers who are certified, they pass the state bar, go to offer pro bono services. So you can go there, you can take your information about your creditors and say, hey, I've got this on my credit report, this is kind of the situation, and they can offer you sound legal advice as to what you should do. They could maybe even also help you write a dispute letter with like their attorney's name on it so you can send it in and get it taken off. There is a specific clinic on here. I'm gonna walk you through this handout really fast. So the legal counsel in resolving debt issues. This website, the Utah State Bar website, has a complete list of all of the free clinics that they have. There's probably 15 or 20, so I couldn't put them all on one handout. But the Tuesday Night Bar one I thought was most important, only and very close, we followed by the Utah um, State Bar, the Debtors Counseling Clinic. The Debtors Counseling Clinic is specifically tailored to answer consumers' questions in regards to debt. And they do that one at the Horizonte School that's just over on Main Street. It's just like a half a block away from the baseball park. Um, and that's held the second Tuesday of every month. So if you guys have questions about your credit reports and you pull them in the next couple months or the next couple weeks, Mark that date in November and head over there and have them look and answer your questions that way. So kind of to answer your question is, can the debt 
reset themselves to they sell them yes to your power in your negotiations maybe your debt was with American Express nothing against American Express I'm using this as an example let's say you had a debt for five hundred dollars with American Express you fell behind on payments they charge it off and then they transfer it to ABC collection company you know that ABC collection company did not pay five hundred dollars for that debt they most likely paid a hundred dollars or two hundred dollars for that debt that knowledge can give you some power to negotiate and you might not feel comfortable negotiating and creditors especially collection agencies are trained to be very bravo is the spanish word um like aggressive aggressive sorry um so they are trained to be very aggressive and like they'll talk so fast they'll try and overwhelm you if they're overwhelming you say you know what give me your phone number i'm gonna call you back in a second regain composure and go at them again but just know that you can negotiate that and say I know you guys only paid this much for it you added an extra three hundred dollars on when you picked it up I only owe American Express five hundred dollars I'm willing to pay you two hundred and fifty dollars to have this account cleaned off and I want you to send me a receipt and a letter saying that it's been paid off in full and you better report that to my credit bureau and then don't agree to make that payment until you have that letter so it's kind of a game of like cat and mouse, like I'll pay you if you give me the letter. You could even do something, have them email you like that same day and also have them, have them mail you a letter so that you have the proof that that's been paid. Um, judgments. These are results of a lot of important, and this kind of goes back to your question as well. Judgments can stay on your report for seven years or until the statute of limitations runs out, whichever is longer. Just I can't provide legal advice. This is research, and I feel like this is education. Rhode Island is a state that is very kind to their creditors. Judgments in Rhode Island can stay on your credit report for 20 years because that's their statute of limitations. In all my research for the state of Utah, our statute of limitations was not nearly that long, but go and ask them specifically in regards to what that is. So, for your sake, you're probably hoping we've only made five to seven year judgments so that gets off because 20 years pursues for a long time. Um, and then just above all else, talk to an attorney. If you guys have ever received a letter saying that you're being summoned to court for a past debt, a lot of times it's easier to take like the ostrich approach and just bury our hand heads in the sand. Do not do that. If you receive a summons letter to go to a court in regards to a debt, if you don't show up in court, the judge automatically defaults and sides with the creditor. If you go before the court and present your case and say, look, this is where I was at in life. I just lost my job, maybe my spouse or a child was very sick. This was a situation I'm not happy about it and I want to make amends. That judge is more willing to work with you and help come to like um, a happy medium or an amicable, um, like, Reasoning. So if you ever get those, or if anybody in your family ever gets a summons letter for a debt, encourage them to go. And they might be scared out of their mind. If nothing else tonight, just remember the Utah State Bar, they have legal services available, and you can even go talk to an attorney and say, what do you advise me to do? Can you help me explain my case and get this established so that when I do go before the judge, I sound like I know what I'm talking about, and they can provide those services. So make sure that you answer those summons letters in court. Um, when you go in and order your report, this is what the home page of annual credit report looks like. Just remembering that you guys get to order from TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. All three of these companies should nowadays have the same information. Bob, it looks like you've had a few more years on earth than I have. <laughs> so you might be thinking, this little girl doesn't know a dang thing. It's because in your general experience, way back when, TransUnion might have not had three or four of your creditors on it. Because in the past, before this law passed providing these free reports, not all companies reported to all three bureaus. And that's where your question holds such weight and is so valid, especially because in the past, your Equifax report might have had two of your accounts and Experian might have had three, and then TransUnion had eight. And you're like, what on earth is going on? Now, most all companies are supposed to report to all three bureaus. So your question, how to tell someone, yeah. 
I, when I look at my credit report, uh, they, they'll list the bank and the account, and they have some number there yes. that in no way resembles any of my account numbers. How, do I, how can I even tell what account they're talking about? Good question. The main thing, because the number, the account number on there is a scramble. It's not, it's not an account number that's on your credit card, your debit card, or anywhere on your statements. You're going to want to look and see what date roughly that the account is open. Because even though they scramble the account number, they'll say the account age or the account date, that should match when you actually went in and opened that account. Now, you might say, how am I supposed to remember when yeah. I opened my account? That is kind of the challenge. And you might be looking at it, and it might say, I have this account at Chase, and you know that seven or eight years ago you opened an account at Chase, but you can't remember which one because maybe you had a line of credit through a checking account and then an auto loan. You can call up the banker next time you go in and say, hey, would you help me do some research on this? I'm trying to figure out which account this might be. And they can go in with your account agent and help you track it down that way. So the account numbers don't help you find out what account it is, but the account age should when that was opened. When you go in, I had my friend pull Equifax, and then I was irritating her because I made her go in and take all these screenshots for me. So when you pull your Equifax credit report, um, over here in this part that's been cut off, that's where her credit summary was. So you can see that this line here is dark blue. That's how we know what screen we're looking at. The credit summary shows you the number of accounts you have. It's going to show you mortgages, revolving credit, and installment credit. And in that very first week that we talked, the revolving credit is kind of like the revolving door. Like you have a balance available, and you use it, and you pay it off, and sometimes you use it again, and sometimes you just spin around the circle and don't use it because you don't need it. The installment credits are like your car loans, where they've given you a set amount of money and then you just work on paying it back. Personal loans could also be installment loans. A student loan could be as well. They give me $5,000 to pay towards my tuition. When I graduate, I have to start making that monthly payment until it's done. So it just tells you how many accounts are there. Your accounts, if you want to actually go in and find out what is my credit summary even saying, if you click on accounts, and then it's going to pull up a drop down menu and you can go in and choose what account you want to look at. Your inquiries here, this is where it's going to show you what businesses pull up your accounts. It's going to show you when you pulled your own credit report. And if you just apply for a car loan and then you go in and pull your own credit report, you're going to see maybe Honda Motor Company on there or Ford Motor, whoever you apply for that loan through on the inquiries. Your negative information will be here. They'll have all your personal information here. And this is where my friend found out that her name was wrong. So she's going in to dispute and clear that information up. There's two places you can dispute information. You can file a dispute just right online when you pull your report. You might be thinking, that's great, but I need some time to go in and do some research. If that is in fact the case, which I would encourage you to do, you can um, go back in to Equifax or TransUnion, or whoever it has the information that you want to dispute and file a dispute online. Each credit report has a confirmation number that's always located. When, if this were an actual report, your confirmation number would be right up there so that you can go in and refer back to that. I would encourage you to print a copy of your credit report or save a PDF file. Because if you need to dispute information, you're going to want to send in a copy of that report and serve the information that's inaccurate. Let me um, touch on two more things and then we'll jump into the disputing. You have a summary of your rights under the FCR, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. If you like to read things, you would find this very fascinating. It's two or three pages, and it's kind of dry, but it's important information. Um, and then remedying the effects of identity theft. All three of these credit bureaus in the last two years have really stepped up their game and their efforts here to help consumers who've been victims. So if you have been the victim of an identity theft, it's going to tell you a ton of information that way. And if you're the victim of an identity theft, and this can be even just a whole topic for another class, the state of Utah, through the Attorney General's office, has put together phenomenal resources to help the residents of Utah reclaim their identities. So if you ever have problems with that, if you know people that are, I can get you those links or send you out email, um, just send you like an email and kind of help walk you through that process. There's also some agencies in the community that provide that service free of charge as well. Okay, this is the fun part. How do we dispute information on our credit reports? I'm passing out two letters, and I'll walk you through this process, and if you have questions, stop me because it is kind of confusing. The green letter 
is the template that you would want to use if you're going to dispute the information found directly on your credit report. The white letter is the template that you use when you need to contact a, like a creditor who put the inaccurate information on your report. And truth be told, you're probably going to want to use both of them. And I'll walk you through this process. So these dispute letters, um, if you're wanting me to send you digital copies of any of this or even the presentation, I'm happy to do so. Just stay after and write down your email. And I don't do anything with your emails after. I shred them and I send you the information you want and then we can still be friends or another person can get. It's whatever you prefer. <laughs> um, so, and, and don't hesitate to contact us if you have questions. We're more than happy to help you out. So fixing your errors on this credit report. And these letters are brought to you in part by the Federal Trade Commission. So you can go on to the FTC's website and just put this through my credit report and find them as well. I am a nerd and I like the Federal Trade Commission's website. You might think it's really boring and just say, Shauna, send me the letter because I don't want to waste my time. So I can do that. What you're going to want to do, first and foremost, you have a copy of your credit report. There's information that's wrong. You're first going to want to contact the credit bureau, Equifax, TransUnion, or Experian. You'll send them this letter, or you'll send that dispute online, just with Equifax, how I showed you, you can go do that right then. And then they have 30 days to start the investigation. What they'll do in their investigation is they'll look at your claim and say, yes, this is valid. Man, we need to do more research on this, or we wonder if he has any proof or any other research for us. That's kind of your first step. The credit bureaus will contact the creditor who provided that information to them inaccurately. So you might be thinking, well, Shauna, if they're already contacting them, why do I have to send two of these forms? It's because the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So while the credit bureaus are contacting, so what they'll then do is they'll start doing an investigation they'll contact the creditor. The creditor is supposed to respond to them within 60 days. Sometimes they lollygag and they don't get it done that quickly. Your creditor has to go in and conduct an investigation as well. If the creditor finds that your claim is valid, going back to my example of when I didn't pay my bill, I send them the letter, they find out that yes, it's been more than seven years and we need to report that this account is in good standing and we need to get off the report. That creditor, I'm gonna say that I had American Express, that creditor, so American Express is then supposed to contact the other two bureaus, so TransUnion and Experian, if I had pulled my Equifax report, and get that information updated and cleared off. Um, if the creditor de determines that the errors are valid and that you maybe didn't pay it like you thought or there's some disagreement in when the payment was actually made, you can resend a dispute letter if you found a receipt or an account documentation to kind of keep fighting this. Um, and if there have been changes in your report, that third step is if they have any changes in your report, good news for you is you get another copy of your credit report. So anytime changes are made, then you get another copy of your credit report. Um, and I just put on here, and I wasn't really sure where to put this, but it says you can also contact the creditor directly. I would encourage you to contact the creditor directly as well as the credit bureau because the more people working on it, the better it is for you. Another step that you can take, and this, um, I love, 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 the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. This agency was formed in 2009 when the housing market crashed because they realized that consumers were getting taken advantage of. This bureau, if you want additional help, will also, you can file a complaint with them right on their website. It's a super easy, smooth process. It's just like a quick menu. You just say, this is what happened. This is what I need help with. CFPB will contact the creditor. They have to respond to CFPB within 15 days. The issue has to be resolved within 60 days. So send your dispute letters and then also file through Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. That's a government agency. And they have phenomenal research and information on their website as well. And they'll help you do that. Um, if you're just really fed up and you want to stick it to someone, you can also file a dispute on consumer.ftc.gov. And it's a really easy process, just on FTC's website, it shows you right there. So this is if you opt to file just your dispute right online, you would click on that dispute file information tab and then go through here and click file and um, you'll get that claim in. And remember you have that confirmation number, you can go back in and track your dispute information that way. If 
few years ago when I was working as an actual credit counselor, I would help people fill out these dispute letters, and we saw some good things happen. Um, it did sometimes take a couple of months, but some good things happen, also some bad things happen. So if you're needing help in knowing what should I say here, um, give us a holler. And then if you want to sit down with a certified financial counselor, um, call 211 saying, we need a certified financial counselor that offers free help, and there are some agencies here in the Valley that do provide those services. They can help you face-to-face. -face. They can also help you over the phone and online, whatever's easiest for your work schedules. If you've been denied credit because information in your report is inaccurate, you are entitled by law access to that information. So if your car dealer says, sorry, we're not giving you that loan, say, that's great. You need to provide me the contact information, so address and phone number of the credit bureau you're using so I can get my free report. Um, and then on that notice of declination for the actual loan, it should give you the steps you can take to get another copy of that. Credit scores, this is the fun part. Um, I'm going to try and finish this up within 10 minutes because we have the drawing. So scores range from 300 to 850. Huge discrepancy there. And there are just, how many of you have heard of FICO? So the Fair Isaac Company is the original company that created these credit scores back in the 50s and 60s. FICO themselves has over 53 different scores in existence. They're actually coming up with a new formula. And I was doing some research. When that new formula is set in stone, there's actually going to be 60 types of FICO scores in all. Then you are going to have Vantage scores. Vantage is another credit scoring bureau um, that creates scores. And then your banks and credit unions also have different <laughs> scoring methods. So you can see that it gets kind of hairy in trying to figure out what exactly is my credit score. Because all of these agencies and companies have come up with ways to do this. Um, how can I see my score? You can pay to receive your score from Fair and Isaac. You can pay to receive your score from TransUnion, Equifax, or Experian. Credit Karma, as you mentioned, if you sign up, does provide that score free of charge. If you guys sign up to receive a free score because someone is advertising a free score, please, please, please read the fine print and make sure that you didn't enter a credit card information in because they might give you that free score. And then in a month's time, you might get your credit card statement and it has some weird notation on there for $19.99 and you think, what on earth is this? And it's a credit monitoring service. You just wanted to score one time, they signed you up for a free service. So make sure when you get your score, it's truthfully free. Yeah. Question. Yes. Because I recently um, got my credit score checked through a mortgage lender. Yes. And I did pay for it. I think I paid like $25. And they actually gave me a copy, and she said that it's good up to three months. How would I know I didn't sign up for that? <laughs> if your mortgage lender actually gave that to you in person, and they're the ones that pulled the report for you, correct? Yes. If they're the ones that pulled that report for you, and you paid them $25 for that, it should be a one-time thing. Okay. You might want to call them tomorrow just to make sure, but it should just be a one-time thing through the mortgage I don't I was thinking about earlier this year, I was thinking about buying a house, but it totally scared me. Because I'm so scared of it. Right, right, right. <laughs> I totally backed out of it. That's okay. <laughs> but I did get that report done, and I did pay for it, and that just makes me like think now. <laughs> just so much, like, have, you, have you seen any irregular charges on your account? Or anything? No. You're probably fine. So it's probably still one time thing. When you're applying for a mortgage, they actually have to show you those three scores, because they'll use the scores from all three bureaus. So TransUnion and Equifax and Experience. If you've been denied credit um, or have been offered credit at less than the best terms, so let's say you know that, and I'm just going to say this because I was looking on their website, I'm not supporting them. Golden West, Mountain America, and America First, I'm going to throw all three in together, they're offering car loans right now at 2.74%. You might think, I have really good credit because I just checked it. I think I should be able to qualify at 2.74%. If they go in and they offer you a loan at 4.25%, something's wrong there and red flags are going off. They offered you credit at less than the best terms, they need to show you your credit report and your score. So you can figure out exactly why did you say, I can't have that best deal. Um, sometimes your bureaus will offer you free reports for educational purposes. Just once again, make sure that it really truthfully is free and you're not going back into it. I like to eat food and this helps me remember things. So I call it a credit <laughs> soup. But these are the things, these are the five things that go into your credit report, your credit score, excuse me. Like I mentioned.
mentioned, different companies weight them differently. This is how FICO does this. So you, you saw that we had 53 types of FICO scores. This is how they're calculating it. The thing that makes up 35% or a third of your credit score is your payment history. Making those on-time monthly payments is the most important thing that you can do. If you've fallen behind, call your creditor and work out a negotiation to get them current so that your little green bars show up again on your credit report and that's what's going to affect the most of your credit score. The next thing that you can do is control the amount of debt that you owe. This is called, the technical term is utilization, and something that helps me just remember, utilization ratios make up 30% of your credit score. Usually it's best, they've done research, and people that only use between 30 and 40% of their available credit have the best scores. Just as a sample, let's say you got a small credit card, $300 credit limit, and you use it to fill up with gas every month, make sure that you don't use more than about $100 to $120, and then you can pay that off in full each month. Um, and that's how you can help your credit score bump up. A lot of times people think, I've always made my payments on time. Sure, I have five credit cards. And they're wondering, why is my score so low? It's probably because they're using too much of the available credit. And just because they're using that credit doesn't mean they're a bad like, borrower. But it does throw a red flag out to the lender, and they might think, if they lose their job, this is going nowhere fast, and they're going to fall behind on these payments. Question. Now, is that to say less than 30% also doesn't look as good? Or less than 30% is high? perfect. Oh. Less than 30% is just fine. Bob? When you're talking about utilization, like say you have four credit cards, yes. and you max one out, and the other four have nothing on them. Good question. That utilization, they're going to look at utilization as a whole, but they're going to look at it more as like one card. So on an individual basis. So let's say you just plan a trip of your lifetime and you have the money in your account and doing this once or twice is not going to like kill the score. But let's say you have a rewards card and you're going on a trip to Europe and you get huge points if you put the whole trip on one card. Mm -hmm. You might put the whole trip on there, max that card off and then pay it off the next month. Doing that one time is probably not going to kill you. But if you've got rewards cards that are going to offer you great benefits, you might put plane tickets on one, hotels on another, and like tram or train passes on the other, um, just so you're not maxing it out. Because what will happen is on your credit report, if on the one rewards card, let's say you had $7,000 available and you used the full 7000 on your credit report, it says like high credit, and it shows the highest amount you've ever used on there. So it would show that you had maxed out at one point. So like, for instance, I, I had a credit card where they were doing 0% interest for a year. Yeah. So I put everything on. You did the balance card. transfer. Well, I didn't do a balance transfer, but I just charged everything during that year, and I didn't pay it off. Since it was 0%, I paid the minimum each month. Right. And gradually it got up to ma the maximum. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that's a bad thing. I shouldn't have done that. It can hurt your score slightly, because they're going to look at your utilization ratios. If, have you lowered your utilization on that since? Well, at the end of the year, I paid it off. So at the end of the year, you paid it off. It's mostly if you're carrying this for like an extended period of time. But I did carry it for 12 months. For 12 months, you carried it at the full balance, but now you, you got it all paid off. You're fine. You're fine. Um, they're going to look at the length of your credit history. So just by virtue that Bob has walked this earth longer than I have by a few years, his score could be slightly higher than mine because I don't have very much credit. I just haven't played the credit game for as long. So that makes up 15% of your score. Your credit mix is 10% of your score, and the new credit is 10% of your score. What it means by credit mix, and that's why I did this thing to mix it all together, they want to see how well are you managing various accounts. So you might have a mortgage and auto loan and then one credit card. It's a good use of credit. If you are renting, or you're fortunate enough to have your house paid off, but you love department store shopping, anytime you go into that department store, they offer you 20% off, and you just can't help but apply for all those store credit cards. If you've got five to 10 store credit cards because you want those deals, they're gonna look at that credit mix and say, man, this lady or this guy's a shopper. So it's probably best not to open store credit cards everywhere you go, but balance out what kind of credit that you're using. And then your new credit. Um, if you go in or car shopping and you check four or five different places and you're gonna buy a house and so you check four or five different places, that's fine. If you go in and apply for a mortgage, let's say you just graduated from college and you're rolling the big dollars and you are going to live your dream. If you go in and you apply for a credit card, an auto loan, and a home all at one time, it's 
going to throw up some red flags. And you might explain the situation to say, oh, I just got this new job. I'm under contract for the next five years. And they might not think anything of it. They might be a little bit hesitant because you're all of a sudden spending all this money. And they might think, well, on earth is going on. So just be aware of that. Um, if you can space it out a couple of months, it's probably a little better for you. Um, what's not in your credit score? Your race, religion, and marital status don't make it any part of your credit score, and they don't care what gender or age you are. Um, your salary, your job title, employment history, interest rates you pay and where you live also do not influence your credit score. And then if any of you are paying child support or alimony, um, and then if you're participating in a credit counseling service or something like that, none of that information is on your credit score. So one of the myths, Danny. Well, for me, when I got divorced, mm -hmm. I got take it to uh, recovery services. Oh, nice. So that deemed my credit, but it was child support. So that... Because I had a judgment. You got a judgment on you for the child yeah. support. So the child support will show up on your credit, credit report. It's not supposed to affect your credit score, but if it's gone into judgment, then it would. So this, I should maybe have said, and the website didn't clarify but this, but this is what they meant. If you're current on these payments, it's not going to go into your score. But she took me to recovery uh -huh. services. If she takes you to recovery services, you don't have much control over that. That's why I love her. I bet you do. <laughs> Isn't that money? Goodbye. Credit miss really quick, and then we'll finish up. So my score will drop if I apply for new credit. These two things come right from the FICO website, and they're the ones that kind of develop the, the credit scores. So FICO said, and this is one of the fallacies that's always been around, looking for new credit can indicate you're a higher risk, but it should not lower your credit score. And that's what I briefly mentioned before. If you're shopping around, you're going to lump it all as one. So just applying for new credit is not going to hurt your score. Um, and then a bad score will hurt my credit forever. Your credit score is just a snapshot in time. So if life was not kind to you in the credit regard or the realm, there are things you can do to get back up on your feet. And I put some of those um, on improving your credit in that slide. You can get secured credit cards, secured lines of credit. They do have first-time borrower programs available through nonprofits in the community, or you can go get a loan, and it'll automatically put your credit score at 650 once you complete paying it. Um, and then you can ask your landlord or, or um, utility companies for those payments. And then just now, if you've made some mistakes or things happened in the past, watch your use, utilization ratios, make your payments on time, and just remember all is not lost. And we're going to talk about next week ways to pay off debts. And the most important thing I can tell you is to be patient. And I have a problem with that because I want things paid off now. But in time, we can get back where we want to be. Um, what we'll do, so this is the legal help that I gave you on that slip of paper. And then there's the websites as well there on that slip of paper for the Attorney General's Office, the FTC, and the CFPB. And then if you guys have questions or anything, you can hang out after. And if you want me to send you stuff digitally, just leave me your email and I can do that. To learn more or to find a class, visit slcolibrary.org slash smartinvesting.